Welcome to the inaugural public lecture for the academic year 2013-2014. History is a story of the past, a lesson for the present and an identity for the future. In the words of the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan and Nahyan, he who does not know his past cannot make the best of his present and future, for it is from the past that we learn. The Women in Science and Engineering program at the Petroleum Institute is honored to have among us today a true Emirati leader. His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Abdel Jalil Al Fahim, author of the book From Rags to Riches A Story of Abu Dhabi, he is a humanitarian, a businessman, a storyteller, and most importantly, a keeper of the history of Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates at large. His story of the UAE's transformation of a Bedouin society to the country with the world's highest per capita income is particularly remarkable because Mr. Al Fahim shares with the world his own biography through the history of the UAE. Hamad Al Fahim was born in 1948 in Al Ain, when at the time it was an impoverished community without medical care and proper schooling and when the means of transportation between Abu Dhabi and Al Ain was the camel. Before studying in the UK, he attended the Quran religious school, then Al Falahiya school. He spent several of his childhood years in the palace of Sheikh Zayed, when his late father worked and traveled with Sheikh Zayed for over 40 years. Today, Mr. Al Fahim is the honorary chairman of Al Fahim Group, managing one of the largest family-owned and most diverse businesses in the Middle East. The business group includes divisions of real estate, hotels, automotive, travel, industrial, and oil field services, and advertising. A businessman by profession, he is also a philanthropist at heart. Mr. El Fahim is the patron of the Future Center and the Special Care Center, both nonprofit organizations dealing with children with special needs. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome His Excellency Mr. Mohammed El Fahim to the podium. Thank you. First of all, good morning. And it's always a pleasure to come and talk to people like yourself, students. Because when I was a student, I won't tell you what happened, but uh, <laughs> you can guess. If my transport was the camel, so you can imagine what the school is like. So, uh, I need the. Right. If I stand behind the podium, can you see me at the back there? Good. Because I'm actually not too short. It's the podium which is too high. For me. <laughs> you know, in every country, in every society, in every state, among any people, you have stages of change. Some to the better, and others, unfortunately, to the worst. And this is exactly what happened with us in Abu Dhabi. Not long ago, we were unknown. We were with 
no record of our existence or we were primitive, underprivileged, below the poverty line and we were useless to, our, to the communities, to the international stage. We were nobody. People in this area just lived on whatever existed. Camels, fish, date. That is our products. And time changes. And this is the story where we start, from nothing, from below the, the poverty line. The only kandora I had was one kandora, which is between Eid to Eid. And I used to wash it every week. On, on Friday, put it on back again. Not just me. Every single one of us, whether he is my age, young boy, or my father, or uncles and relatives, we had one kandora. Not because we didn't want to wear kandoras, but we didn't have any money to buy the kandoras. So you can imagine what we had in the past, what you have today. And this is how we look at this picture. It explains to you what Abu Dhabians are like. If you look at it today, if you didn't know this is from Abu Dhabi, you would think it's from a different planet, somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Asia, God knows where. But this is us in 1957, 58. You know what this, what, the, what the best picture, what the best thing about this picture? It's because I am in this picture, and I'm the best looking one. <laughs> so try to pick me out if you can. No, actually, you're right. I'm the one in the front with no tooth. <laughs> I wish if I had only no tooth. I had no shoes. So we had no shoes in those days. And this is our school. Our school was where or next to the British Embassy today. And this is where it is right on the beach. The beach is in front of us, and this is look at the sand. And uh, I want to show you something that uh, is interesting. Let me see if I, ah, okay. This is me here. And this is the boy who was responsible for building your uh, center. Yusuf, Mayor Yusuf, he was the chairman of uh, ADNOC. And this one, he's your best friend, but you don't know it. Actually, he is so close to you that you keep him to your heart, next to your heart, especially for men. He is... Khalil Fuladi, whose name is written, signed on your, all the banknotes that you keep in your pockets. So he's your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the back of our school. Be behind there, where the, at the back, that's where the embassy is. Now, the school was built in 1959 and for three years period, we had no books, no electricity, no water in school. 
So we had to actually come to school with our bottles of water. The water we used in Abu Dhabi in those days was brackish. Half malih, half hello. <laughs> we used to dig it from the wells behind the palace of uh, Shakhbut in those days. Now, this is Bat ibn Amir and his brother Yusuf next to him. This is my younger brother who is now the chairman of Al Fahim Group. And this is Tahnud bin Saeed, who most of the girls know because he owns the building where Mark and Spencer is. So you all go there. <laughs> and this is me, slightly improved, <laughs> but still no shoes. None of us wear shoes. <laughs> and you know why we didn't wear shoes? Because in those days with the sand, our feet sink in the sand and the shoes get stuck. Uh, so why bother with shoes that get stuck <laughs> in the sand? So we left it. And uh, these, these, these are our teachers. They brought them from um, Jordan at the time, the Palestinian Jordanian. And I'm, I'm, I must tell you, the poor guys suffered so much that well, actually one of them couldn't take it anymore. Just went berserk, he went crazy, and, and he was sent back to, uh, to Jordan because he said, what is this life? <laughs> it's not a life for humans. There's no water, no electricity, no food. We never had any vegetables. The only vegetable was during the summer was roi. <laughs> well, And these are the kind of people used to live in Abu Dhabi. Down to earth, primitive. And, this, and she, she was very good looking, by the way. Don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the life people lived in those days. Just outside Abu Dhabi. We had few houses in downtown Abu Dhabi, but outside, about half a kilometer away, that's where people lived. And that's where. Uh, and how they live. This is the palace. Now, this photo was taken from the building or from the location of the building of Mark and Spencer today, or Ittisalat. If you stand at Ittisalat you, and you look towards the palace, that's what you see. There was hardly any construction. They are not all buildings or high rise buildings, just a simple ground with sand. And do you know why it, it was like this? This picture was taken in 1963. Yani the oil was exported in 61 and 62. But Abu Dhabi stayed as it is. There's no change. Because Shahbut used to, this is his room. Shahbut, the ruler of Abu Dhabi. He used to look from his window here, and he told everybody who came to him and said, Your Highness, why don't you build roads? Why don't you put electricity? Why don't you put up buildings? The oil has flown, exported, you have the cash. He said, no. I like Abu Dhabi as a nice white sand. It's much prettier. So because he likes it, White sand, we had to suffer. And this is some buildings in Al Ain. Al Ain was not a permanent place where people lived all the year. People used to come from Abu Dhabi, from different, and sometimes even from Dubai, and they live in houses like this for the period of the summer for three months, and then they go back to Dubai or Abu Dhabi. So life was very simple. Where are you? Where? I'm looking for her. I was introduced earlier as the person who owns the agency for Mercedes Benz. Well, my father started that business. But my father was like anybody else. He was uh, a Bedouin. He was uh, one of Sheikh Zayed's men. 
who, who follows Zaid wherever he goes. So uh, this is my father's first Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> hmm. That's him. And this is uh, Saeed bin Shakhbut. This is the Shakhbut son. And this is his men. That's how people tra traveled, how they transported themselves. And this is not so, yani not last century. It's uh, only in 1962. So people didn't have a lot of. Uh, and this is where life cha changed. And this is where you're going to be very, very useful and important. And your education is so important to us to keep this flow of oil. And this is the port of Abu Dhabi. If you go today to the Chamber of Commerce of Abu Dhabi, right opposite, this is where it was. This is the port of Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is the airport. The airport today is exactly where Ittihad newspaper today. It's uh, between Al Wahda Club and Al Jazeera Club. That's the airport of Abu Dhabi. And that's how uh, airplanes land because there was nothing there. There was Subha, nothing completely. That's where the plane lands. Once actually, the plane got stuck in the mud, and because we didn't have any trucks to pull it, they brought donkeys. They pulled the airplane with, the don with donkeys. And this is the beginning of the work on, on Das Island. I'm sure you know where Das Island is. Good, thanks. And this is the famous Abu Dhabi municipality. Nobody was in the municipality. And the only reason they had a municipality because Shahbut wanted his son, Sultan, to stay somewhere because he couldn't pin him down. He's always moving somewhere. He told him, look, uh, we'll build you a municipality and you stay in it. So he stays, but he never actually goes to the municipality. And this is some photos of Al Ain and Abu Dhabi. And this is the time, and this is the man who changed my life and changed your father's, mother's, parents, and your life. He's a simple man, a Bedouin, just like the rest of us who existed in those days, who lived at that time. But he was a man with vision, a man with love for his people, a man who was uh, in love with his people so much that he wanted to improve their lives and who would not spend or spare any money, any wealth, anything in the improvement of his, uh, well, I have a telephone that rings, thank God. <laughs> Sorry. That's Sheikh Zayed, Allah Yarham. I told you about my father being one of Sheikh Zayed's men. That's what, that's him, my father, and Sheikh Zayed, uh, on one of their uh, hunting trips. You know, when you think back and you say, Sheikh Zayed never went to school. He was never educated in a college. He was never taught by any professional person how to administrate how to set up a country, how to set up a department, how to set up a ministry. He was a Bedouin. He was a simple person. How did he do this? 
you know, just the, the thought of you thinking about a man who comes out from the desert and create a country. That's phenomenal. That's fantastic. How did he do it? And that's when things started progressing in Abu Dhabi. This was on a football game. That was, I, I was sitting there too. Uh, in 1967, about, a, about one year after Sheikh Zayed became the ruler of Abu Dhabi. And for your information, by the way, this boy here, can you guess who is he? La, <laughs> Yalit. Huh? La. He's the Sheikh Hamdan bin Mubarak, he's the Minister of uh, Higher Education today. Yes. And Hadi uh, Hamad bin Hamdan is the, uh, his, old, his uh, cousin. Hamad bin Hamdan, you know Hamad bin Hamdan. Rainbow Hamad, that's him. That's uh, Sheikh Zayed. Because he did not go to school or understand reports and writing, he used to do his work hands on. He wakes up 4 o'clock in the morning. By 6.30, he was out of the house, out checking, supervising, following up on every project that he does the, or the government does, whether it is in Abu Dhabi or in Liwa or in Tarif or in Al Ain. He's always moving. He's always supervising the work. He, got involved in every small and big project, whether roads, farms, uh, buildings, he supervised it, which, which tells you that no matter how much time you spend on paper and behind desks, nothing like supervising the work yourself and making sure that it is done the way it should be. This is a visit to the local club that we, I was the chairman of the Ahli Club, which we made later, changed the name to the Emirat, and then later on we joined with Abu Dhabi Club and it became Al Wahda Club. And I was the president of Al Wahda Club for a long time. So this is one of the visits Sheikh Zayed used to do when he came to us during his accession day. Every 6th of August, we perform uh, a party or a haflet, maharajan for him in the club, and he used to come and attend it. And uh, this is me running after him. And this is, he, he was sitting. Actually, uh, this is uh, interesting. Those people behind, all of them, these are a group of football players from Egypt. The first time we had a visit from Egyptians was in 69. And this, it was a football team. And we invited them to attend this party for Sheikh Zayed. Uh, that's my father, Sayyid Abdullah, Musa, myself here, and Salam uh, Maktoum and Ahmed Khalif al Suwedi. And why they are all laughing, enjoying themselves, is because we had one of our members, you probably heard of him, Jabr Jasim, who was our professional singer at the time. He was singing a song for Um Kulthum. And of course, they were so excited. And somebody from the desert can sing Um Kulthum. <laughs> 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 and this is, those are the, our future generation, Hamdan or Muhammad bin Zayed, my father again. We were talking earlier about how Sheikh Zayed used to be concerned and enthusiast, enthusiastic about education. And that's what he did. He picked us up, all those who were old enough to be sent 
and we were sent off to the same people. And that the first photograph was uh, uh, these are the same children. And we were sent to England. This is a photograph of us in England during the in sixty seven. As Muhammad Fahad Dahim, he became our ambassador in Pakistan, in uh, uh, Italy, in Morocco. And when, if we go back to the old picture, you see the difference. Those shoeless, toothless <laughs> boys becoming people of importance. And this is one of them. Muhammad Fahad al Dahim, our ambassador. And then Muhammad Darwish Karam, he was our ambassador in, uh, in, in France. And he became our ambassador in uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, my brother here, Abdullah, he became the commander of the Air Force of Abu Dhabi. In fact, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, when he became the Air Force commander, he took over from my brother. And uh, Juma Mary, he became the naval uh, naval uh, commander of the Navy. This is myself. I look much cleaner here. <laughs> and I have shoes on. And uh, who else? Ah, Said Amran. He was uh, he's an officer in the police for a long time. And that's for the type of work that Sheikh Zaid used to do. At night, he would sit with his engineer. He's the uh, town uh, architect, and he will explain to him on maps. But in early in the morning, he would go and follow up work. This is one of his visits to the, some of the houses that he was building, low-cost houses, we used to call them. And this is the work. And this is the result of his work. It wasn't easy to move. You can demolish a building or a house and put a building behind instead. But you cannot change people so, so fast. So unbelievably fantastic move from the 16th century where we were at the time to the 21st century in a matter of 30 years. This is the achievement of Sheikh Zayed. And this is what he did to us. He literally moved us from the 16th century to the 21st century in a matter of 30 years. And this is an achievement unsurpassed in the history of the modern world. The only person who did it before him was the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. After that, nobody did this. And this is the flag of the UAE. Sheikh Zayed was not only the ruler of Abu Dhabi. He wanted to unify the country. He wanted to uh, safeguard the future of the people of Abu Dhabi and the rest of the Emiratis. So he worked for three years so hard trying to convince the rulers of the other Emirates to unify, uni unite. And if anybody I'm telling you today, if anybody tells you the rulers of the Emirates were so excited or so happy or so welcoming to the idea of Sheikh Zayed to unify the Emirates, tell them you are a liar. Because none, not one single ruler of the Emirates was willing to go into federation under Sheikh Zayed. But Sheikh Zayed was a wise man. He was an intelligent, patient man. He was a man with vision. So he, with his talk, with his dealing with them, he proved themse himself 
to them that he is a trustworthy person and they should believe him. And it took him three years to convince them. Three years or, or even more. And I, I was there. I saw how frustrated he was. I saw how difficult the negotiations were, trying to convince the ruler of Ras al Khaimah or, or Fujairah to, to come to a federation. They didn't want it. They didn't want it at all. But eventually, he convinced them and he told them the benefit of the federation. And af only afterwards that they agreed and they formed the federation under his leadership, under one flag. And this is an achievement again, which has never been done in the Arab world. Every single federation or union in the Arab world fell through after two, five years. If we go back to history, every federation, every union fell through. The only federation that existed in our modern day today is the Federation of United Arab Emirates because it was based on good intention, based on understanding, and based on the love of the people's benefit, to benefit the people. And this is Sheikh Zayed with his sons. Not many of you know that he has 22 sons. Sheikh Zayed was only had one son, Sheikh Khalifa, throughout the time, until 1962 when he got married again and he started having children. Now, you would think that Sheikh Zayed was such a, a woman man that he wanted to have more, the more women he has, the better he has. It wasn't true. Sheikh Zayed got married for political reasons. First, to have children so they can take over from him in the future. And secondly, to unify the tribes. You know, you all know, we, we come from different tribes. And if it wasn't for Sheikh Zayed, who actually unified us under one banner, under one flag, we would be t fighting each other today, each tribe on its own. But Sheikh Zayed married into tribes, and he became uh, part of those tribes. And the same he did with us. He joined us together under a, a flag, not of tribes, but of a country. And this is a foresight. This is something that he, only Sheikh Zayed thought about. We didn't think about it at the time. And these are some, some of the early photographs you saw. Those shoeless, toothless, this is a change. We are, today, yes, we are better off. We are richer, we have more money, we have cars, we have better homes, we have uh, facilities, electricity, water, anything. We, whatever we wanted, we have it. But the important thing is not having it. The most important thing is maintaining it and keeping it. And that is why you go to schools and centers and universities because we want you, the new generation, to keep that achievement that Sheikh Zayed and his people achieved in the past. We want you to continue the road and to continue the pace where we have ended. We, our role is finished. We did what we did. We did what we can. But now it is up to the new generation. And the new generation is you. You are the people now responsible in the front of us, in the front of 
the people and in front of your own generation. You are the responsible today. And we hope that you will do better than what we did with our limited resources. You have a better chance of succeeding. For th this is a very, in fact, uh, it's important to me because Sheikh Zayed, before he passed away, a year before he passed away, he came to visit us at home. And he does this every year. He comes and have a dinner at our house, and he meets all the children. He meets the girls, the boys, the women, and he sit and talk to them, and he, was, he knows everybody by name. And this is one of my sitting at home with him. And that's why I wrote the story of Abu Dhabi. I hope you will have a chance to read the book because what I told you is only sections of the achievement. But, uh, but what I hope that with the achievement of Sheikh Zayed with a united front that you will be our future. And I'm telling you today, I am today proud to be an Emirati. Thank you.
or he taught us to be understanding. We accepted everybody here. We have 140 nationalities. We don't treat them differently. We work with them. They are our teachers, our engineers, our uh, doctors, our uh, drivers, our books, uh, different nationalities doing different things. They are serving and building the country with us. So we do not differentiate between people. And we accept, we accept people as they are. And that is why we manage to progress, because they help us progress. The teachers, the educators, the uh, managers, these are the people who taught us how to do things better. And we accepted people, and today we do look, maybe we look different, but we are the same. Can you introduce yourself and what level you are and what's your major? So it's excellent. Okay. Uh, my name is Fatma Yusuf, mechanical engineering major, so uh, First, thank you very much for this lecture to the Keshe Awards. And uh, I want to ask as female students in the engineering industry and the, in the engin engineering and the oil and gas industry, what, do you, what is your advice for us? Because in the future we'll be traveling and meeting new people and we still be used from the United Arabic So what is your advice for us as a person who went and saw and and we still from the Thank you. Thank you for the question. When I was growing up, most of the men used to go to pearl diving. And the women were left behind. They were the people, they were the, the workers who tended to the houses. They sold the fish in the market. They brought water from the well. They cooked, they served their children, and they educated us as children. It is the women, not the men. The men used to go for six months to uh, pearl diving, and then they come back and they go for another three months to Al-Ain, and then they go on a boat somewhere else to, the, to East Africa and uh, to the shores of Iran. We hardly saw the men. It was the women who actually administered and managed the affairs of families in Abu Dhabi. They used to go to the market. They used to do, sell, buy things. And the women, they had character. They had personality. They had self-confidence. And that is what is required from you to be self-confident, to be uh, strong in character, to be assured. And the, the, that assurance and self-confidence comes not from people who give it to you. People don't give you anything. It is from what you learn, from the education you learn. The more you know, it is knowledge. The more knowledge, knowledge you know, the better judge you become. You then you will know what is right, what is wrong. You will you you can judge character. And if some a man comes to you and tells you you are beautiful, thank you, very nice of you. But then he tells you, I have a deal for you. Because you are an Emirati, I can all I need is your name and I have such a big project that will generate millions. Now, if you are uneducated and you don't know much, you will listen to him. And you probably will be convinced that he is saying the right thing. But because you are educated, because you know that it happens to somebody else before you, you will be wary. You will be on your guard. You will not let someone come and con you into making promises that you cannot keep and get yourself in debit in the banks. So the more, the more you learn, 
not just reading your books and uh, uh, curriculum in the uh, center here, but learning about the world, read newspaper, watch the news, read books, the lifestyle of people, the memories of others. How did they do it? How did they reach their successes? Read about them, personality. Take an example from what their achievement and learn from it and try to implement it in your work, in your life. It will be, that it will be your protective against uh, intruders. And that's what will give you the personality, the strength, and the power, and independence to face the world. Okay. Thank you. Father, I can, I can hear you. So uh, my question is uh, basically, how did Sheikh Zayed and of course uh, him and his subordinates who were around him were able to get us to this level with limited resources, less education, less uh, expertise, uh, less uh, tools to, uh, to, uh, to build the country. So how was this done from a centralized Sheikh Zayed advising all these people to do what they have to do to get us to this level? And how can we take that model and build the UAE, you know, take it to the 25th century in, in less than 30 years? Thank you. You know, you think everything can be done with money. Money is not the main aim or the objective. Money is to be used for the good of societies. And Sheikh Zayed had an inten a good intention. When money started coming to him, he didn't think about, I want to build the biggest building in Abu Dhabi. He didn't think about building his, uh, the biggest house for himself. He didn't think about building the biggest garden for himself. He wanted to use that money, that income, to build the life of hundreds of thousands of people. So he had a good intention. <coughs> and to have an, a good intention in your work pushes all other material stuff in your way. You don't think about how much money I will make, or whether I'm going to become a a big personality or my photo will become will appear on newspaper as long as you you believe in what work you want to do with the with the your achievement in future that is the most important to Sheikh Zayed at the time and to his people we want to do right we want to do something that is useful to our society and they didn't benefit from it they had the chance to benefit. I'm not going to tell Sheikh Zayed, don't spend 10 billion a month in Abu Dhabi. Our income in Abu Dhabi is 10 billion dollar, not dirham, 10 billion a month. You can't spend 10 billion dollar a month, even if you put it on the ground from here all over the Emirates. And nobody can tell Sheikh Zayed, but he never spent. He only spent whatever he thinks was right to create something for the people, for his country. And for himself, and I know him personally, I know him very well, or I knew him well, he wears the dishdasha twice every two days. I mean, changes every two days. And every time, uh, Your Highness, why don't you change your discussion? I said, why should I? It, it looks clean. I don't need another. <laughs> he was a simple person, but he had that good intention, the goodwill, the, 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 the wish to 
be a, a, a good person for future generations. And that's why, we succeed, why they succeeded where we hope that today we want to go further and make that success twice as much. خلصنا ولا بعد ما هذا قد أبغى قد. One last, just one, one last question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, one last. One. Okay. It's not every day they get to meet somebody who knows the Latvian side as close as you did. Yeah. Uh, sorry, first. Pardon. Uh, uh, as we all know, all of us need someone to encourage and help us in doing everything. So who was? Uh, encouraging Sheikh Zayed to do this work, this achievement, and who was helping him in doing everything? Who was the uh, special person in his life? That, that who, okay, who gave the point. Sheikh Zayed got his encouragement from the, the smile of people when they come to him, from his children, from his family, from us whenever we come and we tell him, thank you, your highness for the land you gave me. I, I'm building my home for the first time. That was his encouragement. That was what made him, what gave him motivation to do better if he can make someone happy. That was his achievement. On countless times, I was in his majlis and he would tell, call me, Ahmed, uh, do you have a land for the house? Yes, your highness, you gave me a land for the house. Uh, do you have a building generating income for you? Yes, Your Highness. I do have a building you gave me about five years ago. Anything you need, Your Highness, you give it to me. Everything that I need, thank you. He said, okay, your family. Anyone missing something? Your neighbors. If anyone is in need, tell me. Because I will be very angry with you if you don't tell me. I want, I want people to, uh, to, to be happy. And that is the, the happiness of people that gave him that inspiration and the fulfillment to achieve what he did. Because he wanted people to be happy, he wanted people to be satisfied. And that is why today we have no one could say, anything that Sheikh Zayed did a mistake. We all love him. We all think of him. And he, he, spent, he, he spent his life trying to make us uh, better people. And that was his fulfillment and uh, encouragement. Guys, Thank you. It's been a I actually wanted to squeeze one more if you would allow me. Sure. <laughs> uh, you have the microphone. In the beginning, and the Royal Family employed a vast network of uh, foreign expertise in the beginning to help in the development process, which I personally believe now lays the foundation for this brilliant diversity we have in this country. Uh, I was asking, I wanted to ask about the social implication of that. All of a sudden, a city like Abu Dhabi has an influx of foreigners, people from and I'm not necessarily talking about Arabs, but people who came from the West, different habits, different religions, different looks. It must have been quite unsettling to see all those people all of a sudden come to the city and have this different lifestyle. What was the perception of locals in Abu Dhabi of those people? And if you could share a story over two of them. You know, you would think that you probably be, we are all up in arms or probably complain. On the contrary, the more people we receive, the happier we became because most of the people who came to us, they gave us ideas, they brought knowledge, and they improved our lives in one way or another. What can you tell an engineer from Canada who comes to build you a building? Tell him that uh, I don't like you because you're building me a building? No, in the contrary. No, welcome, please. If you know how to build a building, go ahead and build it. I will use it later on. So, Sheikh Zayed, from the beginning, told us expatriates are people who come to help you. 
we can't do everything ourselves. And we must admit, the whole UAE population is only 15% of the total population of the UAE. So we can't do everything. But our ambition is much bigger than our population, our mind. If we want to achieve the highest building in the world or the widest road or the biggest port or the best shopping center, we in Marathi cannot do it ourselves. So that is why we welcome and we open our hearts and mind to all those people who are willing to come and help us. So we treat them, we treated them as guests. And you all know from tradition, your guest is protected. And our, the hospitality that the people of the Emirates is known to everyone. So they treated every single person as a guest in their country. And a guest is always respected and protected. So it is not something we uh, complain about. In fact, the more foreigners visit us, the more we will rent apartments and houses and villas. So you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, a remarkable man, a remarkable story. He has been called a national treasure, and we are honored to have His Excellency Mohammed Al Fahim visit us this morning. If you wish to purchase a copy of the student or full edition of From Rags to Riches, Story of Abu Dhabi, we will be selling them at a discount price on Mr. El Fahim's behalf after the session just outside this auditorium. If you wish to borrow a copy, the PI Library and ILC have both an abridged editions and the student edition. Um, and just for the record, uh, you, may, you may not know this, uh, some of our students, how many of you currently are reading the book? as part of your class assignment. Raise your hands, ladies. No embarrassment, come on, raise your mm -hmm. hand. Yeah, so uh, actually we have our foundation students as uh -huh. part of their English classes, they are um, reading the student edition. I would like to ask um, Dr. Ismail Taj to the stage, please. <coughs> um, we are known as the WISE program and your wisdom is an inspiration for all of us. On behalf of the WISE community, we hope you will accept our small token of uh, appreciation.